Good evening, everyone. My name is Lacey Villava. I'm the Education Manager at George Mason Gunston Hall in Virginia. And I'm so excited to be bringing you this amazing program this evening. I am joined tonight by um, Aaron Adams at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage and Leslie Jones at Newport County, sorry, Leslie, Newport County Preservation, the, let's try that one more time. The Preservation Society of Newport County representing Marble House. I'm so excited to be bringing you this new edition of our Cocktails by Candlelight program, Movers and Shakers. We're going to be making cocktails from three different eras in American history, talking a little bit about Andrew Jackson's wine, and we'll also be talking about the rights and causes of the people whose cocktails we're talking about. So we're going to get started. We're each going to make or talk about our beverage for the evening. I'll go first and then we'll turn it over to Erin at the Hermitage um, and we'll wrap that up with Leslie at Marble House and then we'll get started with our conversation and we'll open it up for about 15 minutes of uh, Q&A at the end of the program. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll get to those as we get a little bit further along. So I'm gonna get started. Tonight we're making rum punch. So I've got all my ingredients here. I've got rum, sugar, and I've got some already in lumps, but this is a sugar cone from the 18th century in the blue paper here. Lemon juice and a little bit of water and some ice. I've let that sit in the freezer, so I'm gonna to have to go grab that really quick when I'm ready for it. But otherwise, let's dig in. So I'm gonna start by putting my sugar in a small bowl to mix. Now you can do this directly in your glass if you have big glass. I am using an 18th century size punch glass, which is really small, it's just about two ounces. And that recipe that you have is going to make just about two ounces of rum punch tonight. So I'm adding my lemon juice and my lemon's a little small. So I'm going to add the juice of both halves of my lemon and I'm going to give it a stir. Now, um, rum punch, if anyone has ever encountered rum punch, um, this is one of my favorites. Um, it is one of the most ubiquitous drinks in the 18th century. Um, people of all society levels were drinking rum punch. They were tasting uh, these, these flavors that we're going to be making tonight, and they were using it to make toasts. Um, and some of those toasts in the early period of American history, of course, were to king and country. Um, but by the time of the American Revolution, we're getting to toasts that are for Congress and American liberty and freedom. Um, and I can just imagine George Mason with a glass of rum punch at the Constitutional Convention. Of course, that's before the Bill of Rights wasn't added, but at the Constitutional Convention having those kinds of conversations. Okay, so I'm stirring in my sugar. I'm getting that nice and dissolved. A little hard to see there on screen, um, but getting that nice and dissolved. And then I'm going to add my rum. So rum is the hard liquor of choice in the 18th century would help, of course, if I could get my cork out. Um, we're going to add about a tablespoon of rum. Stir that up. Make sure it's nice and blended. You guys probably can't see that, so let me slide it just over just a little bit. And lastly, I'm going to add my water. Same thing, about a tablespoon of water. So I've got a nice little bowl of punch. So that is saved for the ice, ready to drink. And we're in a bowl that's about the size of a personal punch bowl in the 18th century. Punch bowls came in a huge variety of sizes from personal to party size. This one is fun. It says one mole bore, one bowl more and then. So I wanna know what happened then. Maybe tonight you'll have a chance to find out. So let me grab my ice, chill my rum punch down. 
and then I'll get to have a drink. All right, so my punch is ready. I'm gonna let that chill just a sec, pour it into my punch glass and have a sip. If you have any questions about how that rum punch was made, any other thoughts about rum punch, feel free to pop those into the chat. I am going to turn it over to Aaron and Katie over at the Hermit at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage to tell us a little bit about Andrew Jackson's wine cellar. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear us uh, through the mask. We are here tonight in Andrew Jackson's dining room, uh, which is a really um, exciting place to be. We rarely ever do programs from here inside the mansion, so we're pretty excited. I hope you can see uh, the image of Jackson that's just here over my shoulder. You're also seeing his sideboard there. Andrew Jackson, um, I think to most people's surprise, had quite a sophisticated palate when it came to wines uh, and, and, and alcohol. Uh, the Hermitage had a distillery on the property where they uh, produced whiskey in large quantities, about 500 gallons a year. Um, but Jackson, as a rule, is drinking whiskey among male company. He's not drinking it uh, at dinner. He's not drinking it with mixed company. Uh, and so wine features very, very strongly in Jackson's consumption. Uh, one of Jackson's early careers was that he uh, was a, a merchant. He owned three or was a partner in three mercantile enterprises here in Middle Tennessee. And all of them involved the sale of wine amongst other dry goods and foodstuffs. Uh, the descriptions are a little lacking, but they mostly are French wines uh, and mostly claret. So when we see descriptions of the wines, it's claret or it's Madeira. Um, so we'll talk about some more of that in, in just a little bit, but we do have uh, Katie Davis, who's here with us. Katie is the manager of a winery that we've just um, established here on site, uh, a partnership with a winery, uh, Natchez Hills. So Katie, um, we've had a chance to partner with, with you on the Hermitage Wines. Um, so why don't you share a little bit about the wines that you brought tonight? Thank you so much for having me tonight. Yeah, so we, uh, we recently um, bottled our newest a wine, it is born for a storm. You can see that we have um, the photo, uh, the portrait of Andrew there on the front. Um, and we, we bottled this one, it is our Cabernet Sauvignon. So it is a dark, dry red wine, a very fruit forward, little hints of dark chocolate and vanilla throughout. Um, and so that would be a, a red option that we have. And then we also have our retreat, it is called the retreat. You can see the mansion there on the front. Um, beautifully labeled. We just um, released that one as well. And uh, that is our Riesling. So that is um, a white drier Riesling that is super fruit forward with lots of green apple undertones on the finish. Um, nice and crisp mm -hmm. there. Um, and then we do have actually one more that is not um, specifically bottled for the Hermitage, but it is a French uh, varietal. So mm -hmm. when you mentioned um, the, the French wines, um, that's the one that came to mind. And that is our Alicante Boucher. So this uh, originated in France. It is a Petite Boucher and Grenache hybrid. Um, and now we uh, get these grapes from the Madeira region in California. We're a really small vineyard down in Hampshire, Tennessee. So any uh, grapes that we need for production beyond our own acreage, we uh, bring those grapes in from our favorite regions. Um, and we obviously are big fans of French wine. <laughs> so um, that is a really fun grape. It, it, I, I say fun because it actually has red juice. Most oh, grapes have clear juice. So this is kind of an anomaly in the wine world, um, but it definitely has kind of a smoky peppery finish. Um, and I would say that it is the driest red wine that we currently have. Delicious. So. And this is, this is an exciting uh, look at wines. When Jackson is, is bringing wines, they're coming from France. They're being shipped in through New Orleans primarily. Um, Jackson picked them up at Natchez, Mississippi, which is about 150 miles upriver, up the Mississippi River from New Orleans. And at the time, there was so little, there was almost no American wine production. So everything is coming from Europe. In fact, it becomes the basis of trade relations between France and the United States, and I'll get into that here in just a little bit. So thank you, Lacey. Yes, 
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that, Erin. I mean, I knew that that wine wasn't being produced in America, either in, in George Mason or Andrew Jackson's time. We just weren't very successful at that point, but that's some really fun stuff to be learning. Um, and I'm excited to try out your Riesling, uh, Katie. I, I like a, a nice sweet wine and that sounds like a lot of fun. So our last drink for the night is Leslie Jones um, with Marble House, who is making us a Manhattan. Leslie. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with everyone this evening and greetings from virtual Marble House behind me. I'm unable to be inside the house right now, but uh, I have pictured behind me the gold room, which was there where most of the entertainment took place under Alva's ownership of Marble House. Tonight we're making Manhattan. Now Manhattans, you might think, what does that have to do with Rhode Island? Well, Manhattan was essentially the base for most of the people that would come to visit Newport during the social season from June through September. Newport was a summer colony and it was a place where people had, people of great wealth had extraordinary homes and estates. However, they did not live there full time. So as we discuss Alva Vanderbilt Belmont later in the program, you should know that most of the context that you know dictates her personality actually more comes from her time spent living in Manhattan, both as a young woman as well as an adult. So what we're going to need tonight to make a Manhattan are two ounces, oops, there we go, two ounces of rye whiskey of your choice. You're also going to need some sweet vermouth of your choice, some aromatic bitters and maraschino cherries. So the Manhattan also coincides or intersects, I should say, perfectly with the Gilded Age that we discuss uh, when we refer to Marble House. That is the time period aptly named by Samuel Clements uh, to cover uh, the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, a period of vast economic growth in the United States and also uh, the beginning essentially of um, large industry, which the Vanderbilts profited from, and that's what financed Marble House. Cocktails also had their golden age during this time period. Uh, the first book of cocktails in the United States was published in 1862 by a man named Jerry Thomas. So the idea of mixing alcohols together to create um, drinks that would be enjoyed in social occasions really didn't start to form in the United States until the latter part of the 19th century. So this again coincides well with talking about Marble House. So I don't have any period uh, glassware, unfortunately, because I'm at home, but uh, you are going to need some sort of container to put ice in. And that will be also where you mix all of your, uh, your different ingredients here. So first we have two ounces measured out in a beaker. There we go, of rye whiskey. That's gonna be poured over your ice. I love that you're yeah. actually using a beaker, Leslie. That's great. Thank you. It's very fun. <laughs> then we will put in one ounce of sweet vermouth, which I'm pouring off camera because it's easier and I won't spill. So there's our ounce of sweet vermouth mixed right in with the whiskey, just so you can see that. I'm sort of botching this, I apologize. Okay. Now, a trick that I learned actually today uh, is to put the maraschino cherry and a little bit of maraschino cherry juice into your glass first before you mix other things, before putting the cherry in last. So right now we've got our rye whiskey and our sweet bitters, and we're going to stir in that ice. Excellent sound effects. Okay, that looks good. And then if you have a strainer, place the strainer over top, pour into your, I'm gonna do this down here because I will, I will spill. Pour that into your glass over your cherry. I totally spilled rum punch everywhere, so I don't blame you. Okay. There's nothing perfect about history or about cocktails. Um, so then we're going to do our dash, aromatic bitters, maybe one more. There we go. And there you have a Manhattan. Enjoy. Awesome. I'm so excited. I am going to have to make myself a Manhattan or get my brother, who I know is watching this, to make me a Manhattan at some point later. Um, but for now, I'll stick with my rum punch and I will step into the dining room at Gunston Hall. 
So I was so excited when we started talking about this program um, internally at Gunston Hall and to bring it all to you um, that we have an opportunity to chat about history, chat about cocktails, and then the conversations that people had over cocktails, over a glass of wine during the lifetimes of George Mason, Andrew Jackson, and Alva Belmont. Um, it is a, an amazing thing that we know was happening during the lifetimes of these people and conversations over dinner tables like the ones here in, in Gunston at the Hermitage at Marble House were uh, a part of how history was shaped. So at Gunston Hall, we talk a lot about George Mason and the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Um, anybody who uh, lives here in Virginia may have heard of the Virginia Declaration of Rights at some point in your time here. Um, it was one of the documents that helped shape ultimately the American Constitution and the Bill of Rights. George Mason was one of three people who refused to sign the Constitution and the first reason that he listed was that it had no Bill of Rights. He had written this amazing document in Virginia in 1776 stating that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights. And that goes on to shape um, the conversations that we have been having for the next 200 years and continues with Andrew Jackson at the Hermitage. Erin, can you you tell us a little bit about the kinds of causes that Andrew Jackson had and things that he was really concerned with and thought were really important during his lifetime? Oop, we may be having a little technical glitch. Yep. Um, I am sure that Aaron and Katie will be back to join us, but while we're waiting on them to come back, Leslie, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about the causes of, of Alva Belmont? I know she had a few. Um, I can think of one really important one, but I'm curious about what your thoughts are on that topic as well. Well, Alva, as we call her here at the Preservation Site in Newport County, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, uh, those are her two married names. Uh, she had several causes throughout her life, but they changed dramatically as she grew older, matured, if you will. Uh, as a young woman, it was her first aspiration to, of course, marry well into society. She ended up marrying well, but not into, not into society by marrying William K. Vanderbilt. Uh, later on in life, after her divorce from William K. Vanderbilt, which was quite dramatic, as well as uh, a cause for uh, social discussion, she ended up marrying his best friend, Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont, <laughs> who we like to call OHP Belmont, uh, which uh, gave her a bit of freedom, but also helped her learn the political process. OHP Belmont was a one-term senator, so he had some interest and some knowledge of the political process, but probably not enough uh, to say that he was her, her source of knowledge. She found her own knowledge and educated herself later on in life, devoting her entire wealth as well as her time to the cause for women's suffrage in the United States. Uh, her vast fortune was used to hold rallies on the lawn of Marble House in Newport to build structures and clubs for women in New York City in Manhattan. And she was very instrumental working with Alice Paul and a variety of other women in the 19 teens and into 1920 uh, to finally get the 19th amendment ratified which we celebrated the 100th anniversary this year. And coincidentally, where all of our roads intersect here, Tennessee was the last state to ratify uh, the amendment. So we are so glad that we're joined by the Hermitage this evening. <laughs> That's so exciting. And I know we've got some, um, some Alva Belmont sites here in DC too. So if you can't make it out to, um, out to Newport if you're in the DC area and you're not traveling right now. The Sewell Belmont, um, sorry, it's changed its name recently. The Belmont Paul National Women's History Memorial, I think is what yes. it is now. I, you nailed it, yes. Yes, um, is a local site associated with, um, with Alva Belmont. But of course, I totally recommend going to visit Marble House up in 
um, Newport when it opens again. You're not open right now, though. Is that right, Leslie? The, the Breakers is, but not Marble House. Correct. Uh, so Alva's sister-in-law, Alice, and brother-in-law, Cornelius II, who built the Breakers just down the street, uh, their house is open to the public seven days a week currently, as is the Elms, which is another period house, uh, period peer house of Marvel House. If you do visit our website, newportmansions.org, and find our exhibitions page, you can take a self-guided virtual visit through Marble House, uh, peeking in all of the rooms, focusing in on the architecture and the fine art that are featured here. So we welcome you to do that. I am going to have to do that because it's been a while since I've been up to Newport. I am excited about the opportunity to visit again. Um, and I'm not quite sure what's happened to Erin and Katie down at, at the Hermitage. Um, the joy of historic houses, as many of you may know, is that most of them are not conducive to Wi-Fi. Um, so we may just have be having some um, technical glitches there. We hope that she'll be able to join us again. Um, but uh, many of you know that Andrew Jackson was incredibly important in the formation of the American economy. Um, and um, Jackson used the Constitution, used his thoughts about the Constitution to push the American economy to drive change, um, particularly, of course, when um, the War of 1812 is happening, you know, we don't have access to any of those French goods that that um, Aaron was talking about. We don't have Madeira or Bordeaux or any of the amazing wines that come from that area. Um, he was also really concerned with the Constitution. So we've got all of these connections going back and forth, connecting us to back to this idea of rights and the formation of country that we have here, starting um, at places like Gunston Hall. Um, of course, we're not the only ones. If you're up in, in Newport, there are plenty of, of history sites that are connected to this and you can go check out and learn more. Um, but you can also come here to Gunston Hall if you're in the area or willing to travel right now. We are also open seven days a week. We are doing uh, small guided tours of the historic area and the mansion, you'll be able to see this amazing um, Chinese styled dining room behind me. Um, and come explore, we're also doing tons of programs and we're, we're thinking about these ideas right here at Gunston Hall. So um, Leslie, I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more about, about Alba Vanderbilt Belmont. Um, in, in doing, all of these things for women's suffrage. She was really public about it and she gave a lot of money clearly if she's building structures. Um, but one of my favorite things and something I didn't realize until recently is that she also designed and commissioned a China set. Isn't that right? That's correct. Uh, actually, it's also available. Re reproductions of it are available on our website as well. But she had a, a specific pattern of ceramic wares, bowls, luncheon plates, as well as coffee and tea mugs for um, the use during many of the rallies that she held, which included luncheons. Uh, they are blue and white ceramics that have votes for women written in script around the edges. And these were used both at Marble House, which she hosted these rallies that we discussed earlier, as well as in New York City. Marble House was lucky enough, as it was given to the Preservation Society by Alva's son, Harold Vanderbilt, uh, to receive a full set of these ceramic wares, which are on view in our house. They're also on view currently in our temporary exhibition called Becoming Vanderbilt. Uh, we have temporary exhibitions in uh, one of our 11 historic properties called Rosecliff. Uh, the bedrooms on the second floor have been carefully uh, converted into gallery spaces. And our current exhibition focuses on the more personal uh, histories and legacies of four Vanderbilt women, which include Alva, her daughter Consuelo, her sister-in-law Alice Vanderbilt, who I mentioned previously of the Breakers, and Alice's daughter Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Uh, it's a very interesting story and four women that live so close together, shared same last names, but had such different personalities and life stories. So um, we also like to look at Alva as uh, if we were to give her uh, an assign an animal, she is certainly a cat because of the nine lives that she has lived. Uh, she began her, her young life in Mobile, Alabama, where she was born in 1853. With the onset of the Civil War, her family moved up to New York City. She spent 
in Manhattan, quite, again, quite appropriately. Okay. She then spent her formative years in Paris becoming quite a Francophile that informed uh, this room that is behind me, the gold room, and of course the architecture at Marble House in general is its model in the Petit Trianon from Versailles. Um, in terms of what she may have served at these events that were held in rooms such as this, most likely we're looking at French champagne as well as, as wine. Uh, she wasn't a great imbiber herself, but she certainly catered to uh, the tastes of her guests, most certainly. Um, so with the uh, advancement of Alva and in her age, she ended up getting married to William Kissam Vanderbilt. Uh, she had her life goal at that point to elevate the Vanderbilt family's uh, social ranking. They had all the money in the world, but not a lot of credibility when it came to um, the high society of New York City and the Eastern Seaboard of the US. So she uh, worked in various ways to uh, gain the trust and popularity within these intimate social circles. It looks like we have Aaron back, which is great. Um, so just to, just to wrap it, because I, know, I know we'd love to hear more from Aaron. Um, Alva also, I think after, after all of her conquests socially, which included marrying her daughter Consuelo off to the ninth Duke of Marlborough, uh, she felt a little bit more secure in her life, we would assume, and therefore took on causes such as uh, the, night, the women's suffrage in the United States because her social standing was pretty well secured both uh, across the pond and in the U.S. Awesome. I um, didn't realize that they married into the Marlboros. That's quite the family. Yes. Well, it does look like we have Aaron back. We may just have audio and no video for the moment. Um, but Aaron, tell us tell us a little bit more about Andrew Jackson and his capacities as president in shaping the American economy. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your patience. We have had a tech problem. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you quite well. Excellent. Great. Um, yes. So Jackson is a wine drinker, uh, really gets more to the heart of the U.S. economy. Um, what Jackson is attempting to do, one of the things that characterizes his, his entire presidency is national security. And national security for Jackson is not only military defense, uh, but it is, it is actually the advancement of the nation and particularly in its economic dealings and in its economic prowess. Uh, and so wine, it really speaks to the heart of that. Um, Jackson, to the best of our knowledge, um, had a lifelong association with whiskey. When he becomes a wine drinker is not quite certain to me. And I don't know what his thoughts and feelings are about wine. I, there's no uh, recording that I could find where he mentions that he enjoys the taste of it, that there's a particular um, type of wine where he likes it for the flavor or the effect or the bouquet. You know, he's never praising wine and yet wine shows up um, in a multitude uh, of documents. What I think Jackson's um, real concern is, is how wine gets to the heart of our trade relations with France. Um, France, of course, uh, had started out as an extremely strong American ally in our, in our earliest years. That relationship is largely continuing through the 1820s and into the early 1830s when Jackson is president, but it begins to falter a little bit. Um, France had always had this sort of most favored status uh, as economic trading partner. And so in the first few years of Jackson's time in office, we begin to see this argument over um, the charging of duties in, uh, on imports, both here and in France. Uh, there was a, an argument locked um, that went all the way back to the treaty um, under which Louisiana was purchased in 1803. Um, and, and a treaty that existed with France after the War of 1812, um, where France had been charged with $25 million of reparations to the United States as a result of spoliations um, from American ships during the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, the War of 1812 is a part of that for France. Uh, and so then France um, had some understanding that we were to, uh, that their that by not charging duties on French wines being imported to the United States, 
that that was their way of meeting that treaty, of satisfying the terms of those treaties. Um, Jackson does not interpret it that way, and nor does Congress. So it begins to get rather problematic until Jackson finally uh, hits on a solution uh, and kind of a new arrangement that's going to make everybody much happier. And he does that uh, mostly through the guidance of Martin Van Buren and then Edward Livingston, who are two of his cabinet members. So Jackson ultimately makes an arrangement with France in which Americans will not charge significant duties on French wines, and France will not charge significant duties on long staple cotton that is being produced by the southern United States. And so, of course, for Jackson, as a cotton uh, producer himself and as the you know, neighbor and business associate of so many uh, cotton producers, um, this is the perfect arrangement. And so then we begin to see uh, a growth in Jackson's own wine holdings. And so I don't know if this means this is his personal commitment to seeing through that arrangement with France and the benefit that it holds to the United States, specifically to cotton planters, or if it's just an expression of his own personal taste in alcohol, and then it's and then it happens to be supported, you know, it happens to just be important, uh, an important moment in relations between the United States and France. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing to reflect on. Uh, but when the when the Hermitage Mansion burns in 1834. Um, the first question that Jackson has in regards to the recovery of the mansion and how the stabilization efforts are going is that he first asks about the wine and where is the wine and has the wine been saved and were they able to uh, retrieve it properly? Um, we have lost our video capabilities. Um, I was really eager to show you Jackson's wine rack, which is here inside a piece of uh, a very impressive sideboard that came from New Orleans. Um, here in the dining room. Um, it looks like we'll not be able to show that to you, but we'll try to get some images that we can share with folks. Um, so Jackson was eager. The other reason Jackson was so eager to check in on the wine is apparently there was quite a little rivalry going on with Jackson and Thomas Jefferson, among others, uh, about claiming the production of Chateau Margaux in France. Um, Chateau Margaux, as your visitors know, is uh, one of the, the premier crew, so one of those first uh, original wineries of the world. It started in the 13th century in Bordeaux, France. It's producing a red wine uh, that they, was referred to as a dark rosé. Um, so not totally sure exactly what that means, but through the archaeology here at the Hermitage, um, we have found seals from those Chateau Margaux bottles. Um, so apparently he and Thomas Jefferson were in a little bit of uh, a debate frame of mind when it came to who had the more superior wine cellar, which was which was interesting to me because uh, we often think of, of Jefferson certainly as the wine connoisseur, but I think that it imparts a sophistication to Jackson's reputation, which most people don't realize uh, that he has. So I will I will drop that there for a moment. Um, but the dining room, as we were trying to show it today, uh, is very much a reflection of Jackson's goal for that international trade. And the wine is a tremendous part of what is on display here in the dining room. I think that's really fascinating thinking about Jackson's connection to, to international trade and his desire to figure out who's paying tariffs. Um, one of the things that George Mason was super interested in uh, in his participation participation in the Constitutional Convention was who got to write navigation laws. I think as a Virginian, he was very interested in that in part because um, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, Maryland owns the Potomac. And as soon as you get far enough off the Virginia shore, in some cases like five feet, you're into Maryland waters and you're suddenly under Maryland law. Um, and Mason, I think was really concerned about who could write those, the, the, those pieces of legislation that had to do with navigation and had to do with who could tax whom over using which waterways. Um, but I think that also has larger national implications as we think about uh, international trade with France um, because of course, um, uh, Jackson at the Hermitage and I have every confidence, Leslie, that that um, the Vanderbilts and the Belmonts were definitely connected with France that we, you know, haute couture in that time period. So we're all in this international connection and concerned with access to 
to wine and goods from other places. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, I wanted to take a moment and, and turn it over. And, and Leslie, do you have any thoughts or questions for, for Aaron or for me? Um, well, Aaron, I just, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Lacey, I was just going to say, um, through a little bit of genealogical research I did recently on Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, uh, we do actually have even more connections with Gunston Hall, as well as Andrew Jackson's hermitage through location. Alva's ancestors, uh, through her paternal side, were originally uh, their first settlement in uh, the United States and where they uh, were known to have made most of their wealth were as merchants in Dumfries, Virginia, which is just about 17 miles south of Gunston Hall. Great. And then on Alva's maternal side, her family has roots in Sumter County, Tennessee, which is about 30 miles north of Andrew Jackson's Hermitage. So uh, there is this lovely intersection. I wonder if there were ever any uh, familial crossovers or, um, or business uh, endeavors that may have overlapped with each other. But uh, it just goes to show that um, as America expands, we have to remember that it used to be a rather small community. And thus, there's a lot of really interesting ties that bring these seemingly disconnected sites together. Absolutely, yeah. And we've got Aaron back, how exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if, if either of you have any questions. I also wanna give some time for our audience. I know we've got one question already. I wanna see if our audience has any other questions that they wanna share with us. Um, and, and Aaron, Leslie, I wanna give you an opportunity to interact directly with one another as well if you have questions or thoughts for, your, for each other. Well, being from a preservation society, uh, Marble House is one of our 11 properties. So one of the things I'm always curious to know about uh, is we, we talk about history and we interpret history, uh, but we're also each in charge of preserving it too, as well as the structures that, and the objects that tell us about um, these interesting people and the times in which they lived. So I'm wondering from both of you if there are any uh, interesting projects that your institutions have taken on uh, that have resulted in, of course, very groundbreaking and important preservation efforts. Eric, do you want to address that first? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Lacey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a terrific question. So um, the Hermitage sits on 1120 of the original acres that Jackson owned here at the plantation. Um, we are very fortunate that the property went out of the hands of the Jackson family and into the hands of the state of Tennessee. And so we had uh, an archaeology program for over 30 years, nearly 40 years, uh, in which we uncovered about 850,000 artifacts related primarily to the lives of the enslaved community here. Um, but of course, it turns out a, a wealth of information. Um, for example, uh, I mentioned that um, we uncovered the Chateau Margot seals. Um, we had no idea you know, that those existed. We had no documentation of that. So just that level um, of information has been really, has been really um, phenomenal to uncover. So we have currently used that new body of information um, to craft a new walking tour uh, of the enslaved community here. Uh, and so we're using that information um, as a way to really ex exploit, exploit the fact that a family like the Jacksons is so well documented that their enslaved people by extension are extremely well documented. And we know how rare that is at many historic sites. And so that has been um, our current strong push to begin to reflect more of their lives on the property. Um, that's also been one of our big drives lately is to do research into where people who were enslaved were at Gunston Hall. Um, and about seven years ago, we were so excited to be able to dig in the location that we believe um, one of those uh, sites to have been. Um, particularly um, excited because we found two uh, subfloor pits. Um, for those of you who might not be aware, people who were enslaved often dug pits of a variety of sizes to hide um, goods, to use as um, root cellars, um, as, a, as a storage space, essentially. And in one of those um, 
uh, subfloor pits, we found a small collection of objects, which included two petrified pieces of wood, a Mason family wine bottle seal, and um, a cowrie shell, which is probably one of the biggest reticulated cowries I've ever seen. It's about this big. Um, and based on the research that we've been able to find, we know it came from the Caribbean. It's only one of three that has been found in this area um, and seems to be related to spiritual practices of people who were enslaved, particularly coming from West Africa and those who have traveled from West Africa into the Caribbean and thence into colonial North America. Um, so that has been an amazing find for us um, and furthering that conversation here at Ground Hall. I think one of the other really amazing pieces of research that we've done um, is that uh, George Mason didn't leave us a probate inventory. Um, people who have gone through probate today, that is something that we don't really like to do. It's not considered to be a very good thing. Um, but in the 18th century, during George Mason's lifetime, and even I think in, in Andrew Jackson's lifetime, it was really common. Um, and for George Mason not to have one indicates that it was either lost or it was never taken. I think more likely it was it was lost and never properly recorded. Um, but because of that, we undertook an enormous research project and with uh, GMU and their Center for History and New Media, put together a database of probate inventories ranging from Virginia through Maryland um, from all different levels of affluency from people who were um, just rising in the ranks in Virginia society in the 18th century to the wealthiest of um, Virginia planters like George Mason to have a better understanding of what this dining room behind me might have looked like because that is what a probate inventory can tell us. It tells us about all of the things of value that a person owned. So a mirror like the one uh, between the windows behind me is something that would have been included on that probate inventory. And that is a research document that we lack. Um, so it was a it was a huge, huge research project. Uh, it took quite a number of years to get it all together, get it analyzed and use it to make a room use study for us here at Gunston Hall. Erin, do you have any other thoughts or questions for anyone? Looks like Aaron might have frozen again, unfortunately. Technical issues, but like I said, the bane of um, doing things Sorry. inside historic houses. Oh, there we are. Yes. Sorry, Lacey. Um, no. One thing I was curious about with your beverage, I always assumed, and I feel like I should know better, but I always assumed that rum punch was a hot drink. Um, ah. Are there variations on the rum punch? Great question. Yes, rum was consumed both hot and cold in the 18th century. I chose to make a cold rum punch today, um, but you can also make it hot and there are recipes that exist for both. Um, if you want to make this exact same rum punch hot, instead of adding ice, you heat up the water before you add it and you've got a lovely tasty hot rum punch. Delicious. Yeah, it's amazing and it's so easy to make. Yeah. And then Leslie, I'm curious um, for you, you know, cocktails is, is clearly not something that is a, a feature of Andrew Jackson's life. Um, when we look at his dinners in Washington at various places, the bills, when he's paying for them, it's always just alcohol by the bottle, right? So it'll be a certain quantity of, of wine or a certain quantity of whiskey or a certain quantity of port, uh, but it's never cocktails. So I'm curious as to... Um, I'm curious as to the perception of just say wine by your people. So by the time that the Vanderbilts are at Marble House, are they, is cocktails the dominant form of liquor consumption as opposed to just quantities of spirits or liquors, you know, just independently? That's a really great question, Erin, thank you. So for Alva in particular, she is considered a true Francophile. Uh, it informs not only the way that she dresses, but also the way that she hosts and holds um, society occasions here at Marble House, as well as at their house on Long Island and in New York City and Manhattan. 
So in terms of what we know that she has served, there are surviving menus, thankfully, that have been given to us by the family for dinners hosted at Marble House. Largely what we're seeing at those dinners, which are served in a dining room opposite this room in the house, is champagne and uh, French wine, uh, varying from both right, white and red, even during the summertime, depending on what the, the course is. She has a French chef that she brings over to work at Marble House, uh, and it's understood that this person also uh, provided um, meals to other entertain, enter, entertaining um, events uh, at her home in New York on Fifth Avenue. In terms of cocktails being served, uh, it wasn't necessarily something that polite society of the caliber that she was associating with uh, served frequently at their uh, social gatherings. We do know that the idea of cocktails really does start to, the golden age of cocktails, I should say, really does exist during the Gilded Age in terms of mixing different alcoholic beverages um, and garnishes together. Um, in fact, one of the first cocktails Surprisingly, that uh, one made popularity and two was um, well known during this time period is the daiquiri, which is a far cry from the daiquiri we know today. Uh, but it, you know, concurrently, we have the daiquiri developing in first in Cuba. Um, the first documented daiquiri actually is developed in Cuba, and then that individual brings the recipe to the United States. It's actually at the University of Miami's archives. Um, and then the Manhattan is also sort of the northern equivalent of a cocktail being created. It's thought to have been first um, imbibed, if you will, at the Manhattan Club in New York City, which was a social club for uh, the political party of Democrats um, in the late 19th century. So cocktails have come a long way. <laughs> yeah, they have. I think it's, I think it's fun that, that cocktail was initially a name for a specific drink and it has now branched out and it refers to an entire family of kinds of drinks um and i i just i love that and i love the progression that we've got we've got rum which is kind of our first you know step foray rum punch is our first step and foray into a cocktail type of drink um and then it expands from there mm -hmm. well we've got a nice little group of questions um from the audience that i want to address um Leslie, this one's for you. Who would have made the cocktails at Marble House? I think you kind of answered this. They're probably not drinking a whole lot of cocktails, but if they had been, who was making the cocktails? So for Marble House particularly, we understand that Alva did travel with staff members from New York City to uh, Newport, which for everyone who hasn't been to Newport or are familiar with Rhode Island, Newport exists on an island, on Aquidneck Island. So to get here, they traveled by steamship at that time. The bridge to the island had not yet been built. Um, there were also a community of uh, individuals who lived in Newport full time year round uh, that basically made their year's salary by working inside of these houses, either in cleaning, um, uh, food preparation, uh, but also in service. So it, it largely depended, but we know that um, at Marble House, Alva Vanderbilt, when she did spend her time here, mixed uh, those two um, groups of people. All right, I, this one, oh, go ahead, Leslie. Oh, I was, all, I was going to specify too. Um, what we do also know from the staff uh, that did work here. Uh, largely, they are immigrants. Uh, we're looking at first generation um, people in the United States uh, coming mostly from Ireland and Western Europe. So that is um, in terms of, you know, if we're trying to paint a picture in our head of what these people might have looked at, they were, of course, decked out in beautiful suits um, and uh, trained very specifically in the French style of serving. Uh, and I, I have the, a feeling that this is very true of Gunston Hall and of of the Hermitage as well that that people in service in the home were wearing some sort of beautiful uniform type outfit um, in the 18th century it's called livery by I imagine by your time Leslie it is a uniform rather than a livery um, and I wouldn't be surprised if if a livery was something that was worn by people in service most likely people enslaved at at Andrew Jackson's message as well. What thoughts on that, Erin? 
Uh, sure. There, there is no livery as such. Uh, I don't see that term used terribly often in the literature of the time. Um, the service in the dining room here and for parties would have been enslaved people. Um, men, most likely, but women would have been involved as necessary. Uh, and I think they were wearing more formal attire uh, for the period, a suit, um, a waistcoat, um, usually those swallowtail coats at this period, and also long pants. Uh, are coming into fashion at this period too. So they're not, they've definitely moved from that, that what we think was the revolutionary appearance, right? Breaches um, and, and those sorts of things. Um, so, but they are not in, in a livery as such. Fascinating. That is our mm-hmm. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Um, so this one is for all of us. What would each of you say is the most unusual alcohol related information that you've learned about your site? That's a hard one. I have to think about that. Well, for the Hermitage, um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump out there and say the sophistication of Jackson's wines and kind of the approach that he goes at with them, this rivalry with Thomas Jefferson, for example, (laughs) um, has been kind of a big surprise to all of us um, in learning about it. The presence of these um, highly sought after prize wines, right? Like the Chateau Margaux. Um, that it really just is the sort of the sophistication that's uncovered. Um, Jackson so easily has a reputation of being this, you know, wild redneck Tennessean from the frontier, you know. And I think the sophistication of, of, of that wine collection is very, um, really serves to kind of dispel that myth about Jackson quite a bit. Leslie? Uh, so I would probably, well, first I'm going to say that we Marble House was built um, and designed by Richard Morris Hunt uh, with a very substantially sized wine cellar uh, located on the opposite end of the house, actually is the kitchen as well as the dining room. So it's interesting in the way that that was developed. Um, but I would probably have to say, uh, you know, at this time, serving beverages cold was certainly in vogue. Uh, and there is, you know, quite a, a a large ice chest that was built into Marble House as part of its construction to facilitate not only the delivery and storage of ice, but then also uh, removing it and using it to serve uh, for alcoholic beverages. Um, that's awesome. I, we know in the 18th century that, that they're using ice, they're cooling beverages, but that, that's not the top of the list on most things, Um, but yeah, that's fascinating. Um, My, I think my most unusual alcohol related thing I've learned associated with Gunston is that George Mason um, is described as being abstemious. And abstemious is a really fun big word to say that he didn't drink a lot. Um, and yet his son goes on in the same paragraph to say that he also had a bowl of toddy at, at, every day at lunch. So we've got this kind of contradicting evidence. And what I'm, what I'm guessing that his son John is saying is that, that George Mason didn't drink to excess um, because we know that he was um, manufacturing cider and pear cider here at Gunston probably making beer, definitely making some sort of brandy um, and cherry liquor. And he's also really heavily involved in importing uh, French wine and Madeira and Canary and port from Portugal. Um, so he's, he's definitely involved in the alcohol trade, um, but it seems he may not be drinking huge amounts of it over the course of his lifetime. Um, next question. Um, did George Mason drink exclusively rum and wine, or was there more? Um, we know that that toddy contains rum, um, so that's that's that rum. And of course, we we mentioned the um, the cider and the perry um, and the wine that he's importing. Beyond that, I don't really have a great idea. Um, we don't actually have a whole lot of documentation that tells us one way or another. This is what George Mason ate. This is what George Mason drank. Um, there are some Virginians for whom we have that information in the 18th century. Um, they wrote it down in their diary every day, but we don't have that kind of information about George Mason, unfortunately. Um, 
Next question. Where did personal punch bowls originate? Why don't we still use them? And are there any examples in the collection? We do not have any examples in the collection here at Gunston Hall, although I know that some are still floating around out there. Um, I don't know why we don't use them. I love this concept. I love a personal punch bowl. I'm all for it. Um, yeah. But it wasn't terribly often that people consumed punch alone. Punch is much more a social beverage. You will see punch um, or punch derivatives at parties in mass quantities. Um, there's one recipe for punch that makes something like 2,000 gallons. It's ridiculous. And I don't know how they consume it all. I have no idea how many people were at this party. Um, but there, there are there are references and there's evidence of all these personal sized punch bowls that you can buy personal personally sized punch servings at taverns and inns and places where you might be traveling. Um, but if you're having punch at home, it's more likely that that punch bowl I showed earlier, you're having punch in a bowl that size or perhaps something even bigger. Um, and Leslie, we have a question for you. Is there a connection between the Marble House Vanderbilt Belmont and the families of both Vanderbilt University and Belmont University? Um, we've noted that that's Belmont Mansion. Um, I may butcher this and I apologize. Adelicia Acklin? Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually used to live in Tennessee. <laughs> so this is a great question. So Vanderbilt University was named in honor of the Commodore, um, who was the, you know, the spearhead of the, of the family and uh, originated in all of the wealth. Uh, his son, or excuse me, his great grandson, Harold Sterling Vanderbilt served on the board of Vanderbilt University later on and was actually one of the persons who pushed for the integration of the university. So the family has had close ties and um, has had an active role in the development of, of that institution. Now, in terms of um, Belmont Mansion, which is at Belmont University, just down the street from Vanderbilt, uh, it is not, my understanding is that there is not any direct connection between Alva, excuse me, Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont, Alva's second husband, uh, and that uh, that estate. So um, something further to be researched. I didn't look into that for this particular presentation, but I'm certainly going to take a look. There are always more things to research in history, more things about food, more things about people. It's always exciting. <laughs> what's coming up next oh, that we get to learn about. We're spending a lot of time right now looking at all of the leases that George Mason had. He leased out a lot of his land to other people. Um, and so we're trying to see if we can learn more about who all of those individuals are. There's not a lot there, so we're, we're digging and it's very exciting. Um, we have a question I'm not entirely certain how to answer. Um, can you offer any advice or resources on identifying an engraved monogram on period glassware? Oh, I'd like to know what that, what the, uh, what's stumping her or him about the engraved glass. Me too. I know. It's so personalized, be, uh, regardless of time period. So, I would be really curious as to where they acquired it. Uh, if somebody picked it up from a just an antique store at an auction, or if it descended through family, uh, I would think that would that would go a long way towards helping you kind of identify at least a starting point uh, of of how you wanted to go about that research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can also look in if you're interested in trying to figure out what the letters are. May not be able to tell you who the person was, but helping to identify the letters a little bit more because some of them can't, especially on glassware, it can be really challenging to interpret. If you look at handwriting manuals from different time periods, you can start to narrow it down. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really hard. We know that, that George Mason's, his monogram um, was a G, a plus, an A, and then an M above. And the A stands for his first wife, Anne. Um, and that was his monogram, at least that he used during their marriage until she passed away in, in 1773. Um, 
but I know that they can be they can be vastly different and it and it really depends on the person. So it's a great question and I wish we could answer it better for you, but like like Leslie and, and Aaron said, something we would be excited to learn more about. Well, I would add to that one thing you can probably be certain of if it is truly an antique piece of glass, uh, most likely you're looking at the initials of a man and not a woman. True. Yeah. You know, interject, interject Andrew Jackson had no monogram on glassware that we're familiar with, um, and he never uses a monogram at all, but they do uh, end up with a silver service set where he has it monogrammed for his son and daughter-in-law uh, as a gift, and it, the initials on it are A-J-S, um, so that's for Andrew Jackson Jr. and his wife, Sarah, so it's actually a combination of their names, not just Andrew Jackson Jr.'s name uh, but it's so highly stylized that it's really hard to see the separation between the j and the s unfortunately yeah and we get that with a, a monteith that we have here at gunston hall the silver um, punch bowl that has a very stylized g and m on it it's a little hard um, particularly because it's also on silver and it's very faint so you have to look at it in the right light um right but I think this has been amazing and I really appreciate you ladies hanging out with me um, here in our virtual space for the last hour. It's been a really fun experience and I am super excited um, for us to have opportunities like this in the future. I think this is one of the best things about the coronavirus is that we have been able to partner with museums as far away as Rhode Island and Tennessee as well as ones that are closer to home. So thank you so much for, for joining me today. I really appreciate that. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lacey. I also want to say that we are offering this program on a complimentary basis, um, but programs like this one are not possible without your support. So we do appreciate you spending time with us today, all of you out there at home, uh, but we also appreciate Anything you can give to support us here at Gunston Hall, the Hermitage, and the Preservation Society of Newport County. You can find out information about how to donate to become a member, find out about all of the special benefits that we offer on each of our websites, which I believe Melanie, my gremlin behind the scenes and minion tonight, thank you Melanie, is going to be trying to put in the chat for you to take a look at. Um, so we do appreciate your support. It helps make programs like this one possible. And all of the ones that we have coming up um, here at Gunston Hall, our very next program is actually tomorrow morning at 1030. If you're ready to get up with us and cook with us, um, we're making a gift that honors Halloween and whole everyday people here in Virginia in the 18th century. And we would love to have you join us. Erin, do you have any programs you want to tell people about that are coming up? Absolutely. We uh, were inspired a couple of months ago to begin a book, a book club uh, in which every month we pick a new title. We meet via Zoom. Uh, we've had participants all over the country, so everybody is very welcome to join us. November's book uh, is going to happen next Tuesday, November 3rd, so we're encouraging everybody to go vote and then come to book club um, so we can talk about that while we're waiting on return. But we're going to be reading This Land is Their Land by David J. Silverman, uh, where we'll talk about the complicated history of Thanksgiving and what that means for Native Americans uh, in the country. So um, keep an eye on our website. You'll find more details. December is uh, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, uh, but all the book club events happen on the first Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock Central Time. Leslie, how about you? Any programs coming up for the Preservation Society? Yes, so we actually have a series of Zoom lectures that are offered on Thursday evenings beginning at 5.30 p.m. Um, Central, or excuse me, Eastern Time. Uh, those are all listed on our website, uh, newportmansions.org, and then programs and adult, or excuse me, learn, and then um, adult programs. Those are free of charge and usually last about an hour and a half. Our next program will be on Thursday, November 5th, and it is about the English Country House and Edith Wharton's final novel, The Buccaneers. So we encourage you to visit our website and sign up for those and to join us uh, for all the ones we have to follow. 
Well, thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, everybody in the audience for joining us. Thank you, Melanie, for being our tech genius today. We appreciate all of you here at Gunston Hall, and we hope you'll join us and our partners for our future programs and consider ways that you can support us. Thank you so much. We hope you have a great evening. Cheers. 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 <laughs> uh.